This morning from Time Warner Cable Field at Fox City Stadium in Grand Chute, Wisconsin. The 65th Annual WIAA Spring Baseball State Tournament gets underway with the first of 16 games over the next three days. The first of four Division I state quarterfinals as the Bayport Pirates out of the Fox River Classic Conference battle the Kenosha Bradford Red Devils out of the Southeast Conference. And a very pleasant good morning alongside Bill Brophy. My name is Matt Menzel, our Fox Sports Wisconsin crew. Be behind the scenes as you check out the Kenosha Bradford Red Devils and their third base dugout. A squad that comes in, they're playing great baseball with 23 victories and four defeats. A squad that finished number two in the final Division I state rankings. And Brof, when you talk about the Red Devils, Nathan McCullough is the first name that comes to mind. Wow, he's a pretty special player. Isn't often you get a, a third round rap show. He's playing in the state tournament, but the New York Yankees took McCullough's last week as the 124th pick in the free agent draft a week ago today. He's a power hitter at 532 with six homers, 32 RBIs. After the draft, McCullough's could not play, or the Yankees asked that he not play in the sectionals, semifinals, and the finals. Bradford or McCullough's teammates got him to Appleton. He's here. He'll start in center field and hitting the two hole this morning. And certainly an intriguing matchup because you have McCullis, who's been hitting the ball real well, but you also have an outstanding pitching matchup here between these two. A couple of teams that have barely lost this season. You have, again, the Red Devils at 23 and 4, and the Bayport Pirates, they come in with 23 victories and six defeats. Ben Messenger on the mound's a good one to go against McCullis and his mates. So this one underway with the Bayport Pirates and Joey Callowertz. The starting shortstop against Kevin Tybor, the starting right-hander for the Red Devils. Nicolas on the year 7-1 with a .99 ERA. This is his 11th start, or his 11th game, his ninth start. He's thrown five complete games, a couple shutouts. He's also got a pair of saves at 49 and two-thirds. The left-handers allowed 26 hits, seven earned runs, walked 15, and struck out 86. Tybor even up at two balls, two strikes against Callowards. Pirates coming in with a collective 319 batting average. They will be for the away team in this quarterfinal, or the home team as the comeback it goes the route of Tybor able to get the put on over to Kyle Ziegler. He is playing first base for the Red Devils, and there's one up and one down. And I'm sorry I gave you messenger stats, which are all accurate, by the way, but he's going against Kevin Tybor, 7-0, a junior. A right hander, 6'1, 190 on the year. Kevin's pitched very well, according to his coach Matt Labuda. He gets the call today. He's got an ERA of 183. Yeah, no doubt from a pitching standpoint, nearly identical. It's just an outstanding pitching match to get this day underway as Ryan Graybick in the batter's box for the Bayport Pirates. And he's quickly had two balls to no strikes. Well, he's got a head of hitters. It's a good sign of the early going. Ryan Grabick's brother played on the Bayport team, which won the state tournament here a few years back under Mike Simons. Grabick just named a first-team all-conference selection of the Fox River Classic Conference, one of six honorees this season for this number nine team in the final D1 state rankings. Now, the thought was coming in at least for the Red Devils. They had 12 seniors on last year's team that have since moved on. Pitching staff would be awfully young. You know, when the season began, the Red Devils were thinking that perhaps it would be the offense that would carry this team and would score their fair share of runs and would only go as far as the pitching development. But that pitching staff developed quickly as Graybick draws the walk. Carver with pretty good command this year. That's only his 23rd walk, 21st walk in 50 innings. He struck out 75. They have a pitching stat that is about a 2.36 collective earner on average. As Tybor trying to fill that void created with the graduation of Michael Swift, who is now at UW Oshkosh. Nothing in one to Colton Peterson. He is the starting second baseman for the Pirates. Squad that finished in second place at the 12 teams in the Fox River Classic Conference looking up at the De Pere Redbirds. Denied their third straight conference crown with the Pirates. But come in here having won seven consecutive games, four of which scoring 10 plus runs. A couple of shutouts and three one run games during this recent stretch. 
point. Leighton developing, tough getting that ball out of the glove for Tony DiBartolo, the shortstop. Ball thrown on that right field line. Graybeck advancing to third. Peterson, he'll stop at second base. Well, DiBartolo had a heck of a time. This looked like a room service double play ball, quite frankly. And DiBartolo had said a heck of a time getting out of his glove. By the time he did, he threw it past the second baseman into right field. And runners end up at second and third on the air by the shortstop. In fact, well, I think it'll be a, just an E6, a two base error. Now we get a chance to check that replay, but that's a routine ball, and DiBartolo had trouble getting the ball out of his glove. So the Pirates knocking on the door. Runners at second and third for Brock McCollum, the third baseman. Coming in batting about 397. Able to lay off. And the appeal says just that. Count even up at one ball and one strike. McCollum a first team all conference selection as well after being a second team all conference selection in 2011. Ball skips away from Jake Costabli, the starting catcher. Back home's going to play at Stevens Point next year. 17 RBIs on the year for the cleanup hitter. Infield in on the corners, back in on the grass at third for Kenosha Bradford. Count now three balls and a strike. Brett Neville waiting on deck for Bayport. Graybick, your lead runner over a third with Peterson. He's at second base. Missed on the outside. Second walk issued by Tybor. Well, Tybor got ahead of hitters early. Or he's got the first guy on a comebacker that has walked two of the last three and wasn't picked up by his defense. And all of a sudden, Tybor is in a jam early in the early morning game. So here's Brent Neville, the first baseman. He looks at strike one. Tie board pitch for the first time since the sectional semifinal. Victory against Wilmot, four nothing. Also pitched in their regional final win against West Osa Central, eight to one. Quickly in front, nothing in two. It's breaking ball there to get ahead of the first baseman, Neville. Break up two. Devil with 373 hitter. 22 RBIs. That average fourth best among everyday players as he strikes out on three offerings. It's pitched there by Tiber, who tied up the big right handed hitter. That's a big strikeout. Two down for a pitcher pitcher matchup as Ben Messenger comes to the plate. Been around 262 this season on the first pitch. He delivers a base hit down the right field line. One run is in, here comes another. Rounding third base is Macomb. He's gonna touch a three RBI double for Ben Messenger. Here in the top of the first, Bayport with a three nothing lead. Messenger goes up there hacking, likes the first pitch and sends it down in the right field corner. It cleared the bases with two outs. Macomb was running the crack of the bat, and he scored easily from first. Messenger gives himself a three-run lead. He goes to the dugout to lots of happiness. It's a courtesy runner for Messenger. So high fives all around in that pirate dugout. And Lucas Lindau, the right fielder, in the right batter's box. Graybick, Peterson, and Macomb all touch and hold. Messenger now with 20 runs banded in. And a foul tip into the glove of Castabli. Window at 351 hitters looking for a home run there. Big cut. Hit on the ground a second. Luke Sinclair on the put out and the end to a seven batter top of the first. For the Pirates, they score three runs. They pick up just one hit. They capitalize off a couple of walks and an error with one left on. Middle of one, the Pirates three and the Red Devils coming up. To the bottom of the first, first opportunity to check out the offense for the Kenosha Bradford Red Devils, who have a collective 335 batting average. 
Jake Costambly along with Nathan McCollis and Tony DiPartolo. The three do up as they have the rally camps on early. Down 3 nothing, and facing the southpaw, Ben Messenger. Well, we gave you his numbers, and they're impressive. The basic one, 7-1 and one with a .99 ERA. This kid's a veteran. He's pitched in the state tournament before. He was here a couple years ago. Bayport didn't get back here a year ago. When Mike Simons, the coach, probably overused Messenger, pitched him a lot in three days rest. He wasn't as effective, so they've babied Messenger's arm this year, and the arm has come back. He throws in the upper 80s. He locates his curveball very well, and uh, he's just tough to square up. Maybe the best pitcher in this neck of the woods, and he's got a three-run lead thanks to his own bases-clearing double. Now this is a Division I state quarterfinal matchup. Two teams that have won a combined three out of the last four D1 state championships. That's ball one taken by Jake Costabile. And looking at the field, they could well be in the mix again this year. Both teams outstanding pitcher performances. Both teams have scored their fair share of runs and each winning 23 games coming in. And both have veteran coaches that know what to do here in Appleton, or more accurately, Grandview. Two balls and a strike on Costabile. And the count even up at two and two. One of those veterans back now for his junior campaign, the Red Devils junior heavy roster of 11. Go along with their six seniors trying to help offset the large graduation rate from a year ago. And Costabile chasing the high heat. Messenger goes up the ladder to get the leadoff man. And here's Nathan McCullis. Certainly the highest drafted player to play in this tournament in a long time, maybe ever. I have to check our historian Devin Summer out with that one, but I, I can't recall a kid who was better than a third round draft playing in the state tournament. Yeah, no doubt about that. And for McCullis, the thought was at least coming in, he'd wait and see what takes place with the draft. As you mentioned, a third round pick by the dang Yankees, but you know, before that, Signed, sealed, delivered to head to Louisville as he's hit by a pitch. Well, I think that's called pitching around him. That one didn't hurt much. No. Got a breaking ball that didn't do much and hit him. McCullis on the eight. Nathan on the year, a 532 hitter with six homers, 32 RBI. That's the 10th time he's been hit by a pitch. He's also been walked on 19 occasions. Anyway, on for the Red Devils and now Tony DiPartolo. Now in his junior campaign, hitting 432, number two beyond McCollis. Red Devils, from a stolen base standpoint, pretty aggressive. Both of these teams nearly identical in that category. Red Devils collectively at 41 for 48. But they don't run as much as they have in past years. I'm going to coach Labuda about that. He said, we just don't have the speed we've had in past years. Oh, seven of eight in the stolen base attempts, but down three runs. That'll nullify your running game early. Right now with one down here in the bottom of the first. Oh, we're totally coming in. That was the thought that this offense would carry this team. Right now they're averaging around seven runs per ball game. At a five to four win in a sectional final to get back to state by knocking off Burlington. And again, they did that without McCullers, who did not play in either the semis or the sectional final at the request of the Yankees. They met last Friday, and the Yankees have granted permission for McCullers to be here. That kind of gives you the impression they intend to sign him. He's committed to Louisville, but again, the fact that they've treated him like a little China doll makes you think that they have plans to sign the youngster. Send him to rookie ball. Well, McCullis now at second base with DiPartolo at first by way of the walk, and behind nothing in one is Kevin Tybor. Hitting 319. Second team all conference selection of the Southeast Conference last year, but that is an infielder. Also earning, I don't mention all county. 
Again, he is one of those back after last year's state qualification that would see the Red Devils lose to the Nina Rockets in a quarterfinal 3-0. Nina going on to lose to Eau Claire North in the D1 state championship game. Trying to get him to chase the off-speed breaking ball. 0-2. Wind's blowing out to right, and it could well be a factor. Just missed in the count. Even at two and two. Barry Holshue is the home plate umpire. And he kind of squeezed Messenger right there. High and away, and the count runs full. Some of those opening inning jitters. Again, Messenger's been here before, though. He pitched here two years ago. And there's a base hit to right for Kevin Tybor. McCullough's able to make his way over to third. Right now, you're, the base is full of Red Devils. Bat being picked up by the right fielder, Colton Lee. As a courtesy runner will head out of that dugout with Austin Shore. Yeah, McCole is thinking about maybe Ronnie Thurp stop sign, put a quickly hard hit ball to right feet. Well, Lindau charged the ball aggressively and came up throwing, hit the cutout, man. So Red Devils thinking of a bigger inning, wisely held up McCole, and the bases are loaded with one out. Colton Lee looking at ball one. Lindo made a good throw, though. I mean, he aggressively charged the ball and hit the cutoff, man. You have Lee, who was one for three with a double and a couple of runs padded into that sectional final W. Nice stop with Taylor Nay behind the plate for Bay Port, pointed off that short hop. Count now with two balls and no strikes. The messenger's command has left him. He's only walked 14 all year. And we were talking a second ago, and you had mentioned, you know, he's been here before, and he's been on this stage. But do you think that, I mean, still plays a factor? I mean, you're playing in front of a pretty good crowd, realizing what's at stake? Well, yeah, I think that's just natural. But you would think the fact he'd been here, I just think it's goofy playing at 8 in the morning. I mean, sure. these kids aren't used to doing that. Talking to Battle of Booty, Red Devils have worked out the last week at 6.30 in the morning to try to get ready for this. But... Cold strike three, and Colton Lee out number two. Messenger comes back to get Lee after being behind in the count. Big strikeout. You got to swing the bat here. Just like Messenger unloaded the bases with a two-out double in the top of the inning, Danny Simonson is going to be asked to do the same thing here now in the bottom of the first. To the count for to the mound with Nay along with Messenger. Bradford last year was thought in that second game time slot. The game that will follow this one, 35 minutes following the conclusion. But you're right, typically when you get that eight o'clock game, when you're dealt that card, you, as you mentioned, you tend to make adjustments that week before and find yourself waking up a little bit early. And but baseball is not meant to be played at 8 <laughs> a.m. I mean, the, the level of the sun is different in the sky for infielders and outfielders. It is a cloudless sky. It is a beautiful morning with temperature in the 50s. But you're just not used to playing, and you can tell by the shadows, the sun's at a different point in the sky than it usually is when you watch baseball in this ballpark. And the winner of this game doesn't play again until 6 p.m., approximately. Another ball had just missed. Simonson at one ball and two strikes. Runners all around those bases with two down. Swing and a miss, and Messenger striking out three as the Red Devils strand the bases loaded. After one, three nothing, Pirates. To the top of the second inning from Time Warner Cable Field at Fox City Stadium in Grand Chute. Bayport on top of Kenosha Bradford, three nothing in this D1 state quarterfinal. With Bill Brophy and Matt Menzel on hand. For the Pirates, Aaron Hermson will lead things off against Kevin Tybor. 
Opportunity though on the bottom of the first four, the Red Devils, they strand the bases loaded. Messenger able to come right back, strike out the final two hitters he faced. Pretty impressive the way he came back and get two big strikeouts. Tiber got one of the strikeouts in the top of the first with the bases loaded, but he couldn't finish off Messenger, who's three run doubles, the difference in the game right now. Hermanson able to foul off that pitch. Coming in with a 326 batting average. He has a kind of one ball and two strikes. Ball just missed. Totally about the Red Devils and their last visit here to Grand Shoot. There's a swing and a miss, and Tybor. Now this second strikeout. For the Bayport Pirates, this being their ninth state tournament appearance. First since they brought home the second straight D1 state championship in its program's history in 2010. At a 25 win season in which they would go on to be Madison LaFollette in the championship game thanks to Ben Messenger. In a five RBI performance that game, a grand slam home run and the number nine hitter. Hunter Callen now the number nine hitter for the Pirates and this season's version of the Pirates. He's behind nothing in two. Rope in the glove. Di Bartolo able to put it away and there are two up and two down. We're going to talk a lot about bats the next three days. There's a pretty good example of what the new bat has done. It's just Balls aren't hit as hard and you'll see outfielders don't play as deep particularly in this ballpark, a minor league facility and uh, it's going to take a poke to get out of here with the, the, new, uh, the new bats that are employed in the, in the, by high school federations throughout the country this year. The way it's been explained to me is there's no longer that trampoline effect, that ball leaving that bat. Well, they've narrowed the sweet spot. I mean, colleges introduced it last year, and statistically, run scoring was down nationwide. Home runs were way down. But I think you'll see it more in this tournament than you did in the Division Three World Series here a couple of weeks back. A late break for the baseball, but a full-body diving catch by Colton Lee retires Callowertz. There's Pirates go one, two, three. Another pretty good example. Lee playing shallow. The ball didn't jump off the bat. That ball is over his head a year ago. Right now, it's a nice diving catch by Lee to end the inning. Vinny Collado will lead things off for Canosa Bradford as we move to the bottom of the second inning. 3 nothing in favor of the Bayport Pirates. Different day and a different result so far for the Red Devils after they were the team that was able to jump in front in their sectional final by scoring two on the first and then eventually taking control by the fourth. Had an opportunity in the bottom of the first, but would strand the bases loaded. Able to walk once. Nicola was, Nicolas was hit by a pitch and then he had Tybor, who was able to single before back-to-back -back cage for Messenger. Kalata coming in batting 217. He has played about 17, 18 games coming in. Red Devils have had a couple of injuries this season, nothing real significant. You have Kyle Ziegler who's waiting on deck. He's one of those players that made a comeback a couple of weeks into the regular season after suffering a football injury. Colorado had a two, uh, drove in two runs in the sectional final against Burlington. That part of a one for three performance, which included a double. You were talking about the, the new bats that have been put in place now at the prep level here this season. What do you think? You like it? Well, it changes the game in a big way. I think it changes the way the coaches play for, instead of playing for big innings, they play a lot more small ball. It puts more of an emphasis on on uh, having to execute the fundamentals, bunting and getting guys over and hitting behind runners. And and I think, I think that's good. The kids learn the fundamentals of the game. And it certainly, as you say, takes the trampoline effect out of 
out of the bat. It, it makes the game more safer. The pitchers were at risk, I think, the way the balls came off those aluminum bats in years past. But it changes the game. And it's, uh, I said, between innings, I don't think there'll be a home run hit here this in the next three days. It's a minor league park, a, a big park, 325 down each line. And then it shuts out in a hurry. It's 405 to the flagpoles in the right center is the deepest part, but the power alleys are are pretty big, and, and these kids just aren't that strong. Now, if the wind turns around, <laughs> and I'm again, McCullough gets a hold of one, and they may make a liar out of me, but I, I again, and you see in the way the up, outfielders are positioned in the early going of this game, they're playing a lot more shallow than they did a year ago, or what, we, what we've seen in past state tournaments here, because the ball just doesn't carry as far. Right now, the count, two balls and two strikes to Kyle Ziegler. He but again, they've done statistical analysis on what the uh, BB Corbats did to the college game. And, and home run productions were down, I think, 59%, and, and runs were down dramatically. So, And right now, strikeout production sky high from Messenger. He has struck out four consecutive, five for the game. Yeah, it doesn't matter what they use a wood bat or a BB core bat or last year's juiced up model, the way Messenger's throwing right now. Well, after you had that brief little conference with his catcher, Taylor Nay, he has been lights out. Here behind 1 0 against Justin Costabli. Justin batting 390. That is third among everyday players. Count even up. Justin in his senior campaign, one of the six Red Devil seniors. Now behind one and two. In talking about those bats, though, even the home runs are down. You're going to see more doubles there. I mean, the. Again, the gaps, you got to cover a lot of ground in center field here. Unless you've got a great defensive center fielder, the ball's going to carry a long way to the to the wall if you hit one of the gap. Colton Peterson and a 1-2-3, bottom of the second for Ben Messenger and the Pirates. After two, it remains 3-0 Bayport. Top of the third inning here from Grand Shoot, a 3 0 lead for the Bayport Pirates. Game one of 16 over the next three days to determine four divisional spring baseball state champions. And again, if you look at the Division I field, we alluded to this earlier, these have got to be two of the favorites. The other one may well come out of the last quarterfinal game, which matches top ranked Sun Prairie with only one loss against Appleton North the hometown team. But if you try to rank the field, you got to think either one of these two teams or those two teams are your, are your favorites and may well play Thursday night at six for the D1 title. Of course, today you have the four quarter finals and then tonight a couple of semis before D1 gets a much deserved day off preparing for that championship game on Thursday and then D4, 3, and 2 take over the field tomorrow. Graybick has the ball bouncing away. The appeal says it's, well, they say it's a ball, and they were telling Ryan Graybick to run, but based on the appeal, it's only ball three. I think Graybick got confused. They, they wanted to appeal from the base umpire whether he swung or not. And in all the confusion, Graybick decided if the ball got away from the catcher, if it was a strike, he better have his get down to first base. Second walk of the day for Ryan Graybick. Third issued by Kevin Tybor, who was coming off a 1 2 3 second. You, might, now, you might see a bunt here. Bayport likes to add on with a lot of small ball. Grimmick's their stolen base leader at 13 of 15. So Got to think they're going to put something on here. There is that bunt by Colton Peterson, a beauty, and Tybor's only play is the first. Mike Simons, good baseball guy. He likes to play small ball. Won 305 games that way since being hired in 94. But we have some squeeze in the winning run in the title game here with a freshman. 
So no, he's great. not afraid to bunt. Yeah, Graybeck now in scoring position because of that bunt. And Brock Macomb, he would walk in his first plate appearance. Behind nothing in one. And Mike Simons back as the varsity head coach for the Pirates. He's been the varsity coach since 1994. Little looper. That's a gap shot. Rounding third base is Graybick. He's going to score. Macklin thinking three. That's what I'm saying. We hit the gap. He's going to go for, oh, they put the stop sign up. He was thinking inside the park homer, but the way the outfielders are now positioned defensively at a shallow depth, it's a long way to the wall if you hit the gap. And that one had some, some zip on it and went all the way to the wall. It was a run scoring triple. For Macomb, it's 4 nothing Bayport, but you are going to, you may not see a lot of home runs, but you are going to see a lot of doubles and triples the next uh, couple days. First triple of the season for Macomb, that's the fifth, I should say the third for the Pirates collectively this season. A 4 nothing lead with one down here in the top of inning number three. And it forces Madela Buda to bring the infield in to try to Keep Bayford from going up 5-0. 2-0 to Brett Neville, a strikeout victim for out number two in the first inning. <laughs> Setting up that defensive lineman for you for the Red Devils. You have Justin Costabli along with Nathan McCullis and Colton Lee from left to right field. But as you mentioned, that infield that was drawn in you have Danny Simonson, Tony DiBartolo, Luke Sinclair, and Kyle Ziegler from third to first. And a four-pitch walk for Brett Neville. Man, we're going to get a visit to the mound by the pitching pick, the coach. Been a rough start for Kevin Tybor. He faced seven of the first, which included a couple of walks plus an E6. Before the bases were clear, thanks to Ben Messenger coming through with a three RBI double. Able to bounce back though on the second with a one, two, three second inning, which included a strikeout. But now about to face his fifth batter here in the third. Well, this conversation may be as much about what to do defensively if they put a play on here with runners in first and third and one out. What to do if Messenger squeezes, what to do if, if they run uh, the runner at first in a stolen base attempt. Do you throw through or or how do you want to play the infield? This Tiber, how's he going to pitch messenger here? They elect to play the infield at double play depth. So far, the Pirates have four runs, but on just two hits. One of those belonging to messenger. A little looper that's going to hang. Put away out and left by Justin Costabli. But Deep enough to score Mackle. RBI sack fly for Ben Messenger, his fourth run batted into the of the morning. This piece of situational hitting. He gets the fly ball he needs. Again, wasn't real deep, but deep enough to score Mackle. And it's 5 0 for the Pirates. Two down for Lucas Lindau. He would ground out the second base for the third out in that first inning. I think they appeal, yep, they uh, appeal to third, and Larry Holshue, home plate umpire, not Dave Steiger, the third base umpire, ruled that Blackholm did not leave early. Ben Messenger must just love being on this stage, but then again, who wouldn't? But he has excelled at this level. He had the five RBI performance the last time this team was here in a, the state championship win. And, he has backed that performance up with a four RBI performance so far in this quarterfinal. Already again, the three RBI double, now the RBI sack fly. Gives him over 21 on the season. Count goes to one and two on Lindau. And even from a pitching standpoint, he is he has been on. He has struck out four of the last five batters he has faced. Five Ks out of the first six outs. Yeah, I think when the day is over, Matt, you're going to talk more about the way he dominated a pretty good hitting Kenosha team, at least the way he's thrown in the early innings. 
number of college scouts here in this early morning. The lacrosse staffs here in Stevens Point. Among others, but there's a lot of a lot of college guys down there. I gotta say WIAC is well represented right now. Here's the payoff. Lindau to first, Neville moves to second. Aaron Hermson, a strikeout victim for the first out, part of that one, two, three second. Aaron Hermson. So this is another seven batter frame for Kevin Tybor. As Neville, your lead runner over at second base. Just the first of six games here in the opening day of the 65th annual WIAA Spring Baseball State Tournament. And all 16 right here via FoxSportsWisconsin.com. The bullpens have been switched to the outfield here for timber rattler games, and the bullpens in the outfield were used during the College World Series, but Last year, the high schools warmed up on the sidelines or on the warning track. But anyway, that's a long way of saying there is no activity in the Red Devils bullpen. Well, the ball skips away there for a second from Costabli. Neville's team put it second, Lindell over at first base. We have two down here. And the seven batter, top of the third, that has already seen the Pirates score two more and enhance their lead to 5 nothing. Able to reach way down low as Sinclair. Nice play made by the second base. Was that ball attempted a tail away from Sinclair? A 4 3 put up puts an end to a two run third inning after two on a one half. It's three, five nothing now, Bayport. To the bottom of the third, a five nothing lead for the Bayport Pirates. Great morning for baseball. It's cool off a little bit from that of the past couple of days here in Wisconsin. As Brof has mentioned, the wind blown out to right field. Top of the order for the Red Devils, beginning with Jake Costabli. But this has been the place to be for baseball over the last, boy, what, number of weeks now. You have a D3 national champion being crowned. The Wisconsin Timber Rattlers right now on the verge of winning a first half division championship. Now four divisional high school spring baseball teams will be crowned state champs. They're busy playing. Yeah. The Timber Rattlers playing yesterday now hit the road for six consecutive part of their all-star break. As we've been telling you, 16 games now for this crew and the staff for the next 72 hours. Two balls, two strikes. Costabli a strikeout victim back in the first. And Kenosha's got to do something second time through the order against Messenger. Well, there's strikeout number six for Messenger. One down for McCollis. He was hit by the first pitch he received in that first inning. First plate appearance. He is back after he did not play for the Red Devils a year ago. Went down to Georgia and played during the summertime down there only to come back. He played for a traveling team out of the land of Dixie. Played 75 games. So he lived on his own from May through August. Ate a lot of frozen pizza and had plenty of eggs in that refrigerator. Living the college life early. The frozen pizza and eggs, his diet during the last summer. Finished off his, what was his junior campaign. The first three quarters he was at school, but then finished that final quarter online. That one is hit pretty hard. And it's off the wall. And that is why the Yankees like Nathan McCullers. My goodness. Impressive left-handed stroke. Compact stroke, and boy, he just smokes this ball. 
Now he had Lindau turned around. A one out double for the Red Devils center fielder. That is why he was the 124th pick in the free agent draft. I'm told he's got a great head on those shoulders. A guy that is not big headed by any stretch of the imagination, wants to go out there and do whatever he can to help out his teammates, help his team win ball games. Doesn't let the success get to him. Again, he came back after a season away from this team, coming back, not expecting to be the, the show, not expecting to be the center of attention, despite what the numbers indicate. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, you don't go to Atlanta and play 75 games and, with a travel team of all-stars and not think you're going to come back. That's how he got noticed by the Yankees. And but he didn't want that attention. Well, that may, that may be the case, but when you come back to a team that won 21 games a year ago and you hit like way like he hits, it's not like you're uh, going to be anonymous very long. No, and, and I'm sure he realizes that, but it's one of those where he just wants to, again, go out there and be the best teammate he can possibly be. And, put this team in position to try to bring on that state championship. And right now he stands over at second base. Two down for Kevin Tybor. Couple of hits for the Red Devils. The first belonging to Tybor. Can't even open one and one. Only three members of the Red Devils have made contact against Messenger. Tybor, McCullis, and Castabli. We hit a ground out there. And the second. Count of two balls and a strike. Otherwise, again, three strikeouts in the first, a couple in the second, and a couple so far here in the third for Messenger. Three and one. Back in that sectional final, Ben Messenger playing out in the field after a complete game victory in the sectional semis. He, like Tybor, also getting the start in that regional final. Run to the count full of three and two. This kid knows how to pitch. Set up his breaking ball there and Comes in the fastball in the inside corner. He's only walked one, hit a batter. Although it acted like he was pitching around McCullough's when he hit him. They don't let that one get away. First and second for Colton Lee. And again, out of that dugout comes Austin Shore as the courtesy runner for Tybor. Messenger, the Cold Conference Player of the Year, as announced about a week ago. Sharing those honors with Sheboygan South pitcher Taylor Ditter, a senior. Callowertz goes the short route to Peterson. That to retire Shore and the Red Devils here in the bottom of the third. Two more left on base. That makes five left on base through three for the Red Devils. They trail the Pirates 5 0. Four, Sunsplash morning here in Grand Shoot as we head to the top of the fourth in our first Division I state quarter final. Summer break for students everywhere as these teams battle for a state championship. Probably going to step closer as Hunter Callen leads things off for the Bayport Pirates. Already a 5-0, having scored five times on just two hits. They're drawing at least four walks in the ball game. Catch being made out in center field by McCullis. And there's one up and one down. Play by McCullis so you can flash the leather as well. Comes over and goes down to make a nice catch to get the leadoff man in the fourth. 
Tiber's done a good job of doing that. He's retired the leadoff man in three of the four innings. Do you think early on, you know, we were talking about this off the air with the sun being positioned where it is. Do you think guys are having a tough time reading that baseball out in the field? We I mean, know we are. Yeah. I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't think they look like they've had a tough time uh, out there the way they've got jumps on balls. But talking to kids who played during the Division Three championship, they talk about how it was tough to pick the ball up off the silver bleachers here. Again, the uh, the games during the college tournament started at 10 a.m. We're not even cold. Well, I guess we're an hour away. They had problems, particularly outfielders, picking up fly balls and low-line drives off the bat. Little tamper and Ziegler. Nice stab coming over to cover was Kevin Tybor to retire Callowards. Two down for Ryan Graybick. I would just think that the uh, kids aren't used to getting up at 5, 30, and 6 to play baseball. The teenagers when school's out. I think that's the biggest <laughs> adjustment they had to make for this game and then we'll do it again tomorrow for a division four game at eight o'clock counted two balls and no strikes to gray Bick. he has walked two times he has scored twice and the defense hadn't really been a problem Tiber's no. problem has been his lack of control he had the D Bartolo had the error which certainly hurt him in the three run first inning but Two walks came in to score, and the walk came in to score in the third. That's kind of been his downfield. That and he can't been able to get Brock Messenger out, or Ben Messenger out. Three balls and a strike to the Pirate center fielder. And walking for the third plate appearance. Two out walk, extending the inning for Colton Peterson. He reached by the lone error in this game in E6 in that first. There goes the runner and the throw. Will bounce away from DiPartolo, a stolen base for Ryan Graybeck. Team high 14th for Graybeck has only been caught twice. And he might have hurt himself in the slide. He waves the coach off. Peterson back into the right batter's box and nothing at one. Nearly grazed the jersey in the count. One ball, one strike. Now for Tybor, two walks in that first, issuing three walks in the third, and now one here in the fourth. In foul territory, Ziegler puts it away for out number three. So no runs, no hits, no errors with Graybick. Left at second base. To the bottom of the fourth, it's stage 5 nothing, Bayport. A 5 nothing lead for Bayport as we head to the bottom of the fourth inning. Matt Menzel with Bill Brophy, our crew behind the scenes here from Grand Shoot. Danny Simonson will lead things off for the Red Devils in the first pitch he sees. He is taken for ball one from Ben Messenger. Messenger now with seven strikeouts to the first nine outs. Can't even up at one and one. Simonson, a linebacker on their football team as well as we have a stoppage. Baseball getting loose. The bullpen is active down the left field line, and the ball eluded the catcher as there is bullpen activity for Kenosha Bradford. That being Colton Lee. 
Counted a ball and two strikes on the bouncer that heads toward the Bayport dugout area. Okay, Mike Simon's in that dugout as the head man. He was the JV coach prior to taking over the varsity responsibilities in 1994. You get all the Pirates back to the state. Now for the eighth time since he's been at the helm. Their first appearance came back in Class A in 1983. But a regular over four appearances the last five seasons. And a called strike three. Simonson down on strikes for a second at bat. Three of the eight strikeouts have been looking. He's got pretty good stuff. Eight strikeouts now for Messenger. Collada behind nothing in one. And while Bradford has had chances, they've stranded five in the first three innings. Messenger has retired the leadoff man now in every inning. That'll help you defuse any rallies. <laughs> bases left loaded for the Red Devils. They loaded the bases with one down back in the first. And a pair left down in the third. And that was a defensive swing. Ziegler on deck for the Red Devils. One ball, two strikes, two collada up. Missing high and away. Red Devils came into the season number one in the preseason area rankings, number eight in the state rankings. As Nate takes a shot, needs a couple of moments to collect himself. And again, when you look at the way this season has gone for the, the Red Devils with their 23 victories and four defeats. Another team that dominated the Southeast Conference, the five-team conference, and bringing home a third consecutive regular season championship. Only difference between this year and last was the fact they actually lost a conference game. It snapped a 20-game conference winning streak when they fell against Racine Horlick on May 4th. Ball put away in right field by Lucas Lindau. Two down. Aside from the McCullis, one hopper off the wall and right, and that wasn't a thing of beauty. Kenosha Bradford really hasn't squared up a ball against Messenger yet. Yeah. They did that. It's right at the right fielder. Yeah, right hand Lindau, back to back catches for the right fielder, and a one, two, three, fourth for Ben Messenger. After four, five nothing, Bayport. Moving along to the top of the fifth inning, a five nothing lead for Bayport in this Division I state quarterfinal. Brock Macomb leads things off for the Pirates against Kevin Tybor. Back to right field goals. Colton Lee was getting loose last half inning. Colton Lee was coming off a complete game victory on the hill against Burlington in that sectional final. Up and in, 2-0. and oh. by, of this? by getting Lee up, I think it just got, gave... Uh, the coach an option in case Tiber continues to struggle here. He faced seven of the first. He faced seven in the third. Had a one, two, three second, and then bounced back in the fourth to face just four. Can't even open two and two. Winner of this game moving on to battle the winner of our next game between Middleton and Hartford. Skips up the middle of base hit for Macomb. He's two for two. This just the third hit of the morning for the Pirates. Then again, as they did the last time the leadoff man got on, you would assume Bayport's going to try to add on here and play a little small ball. Neville keeping the bat over that 
Right shoulder, but damage done if the ball gets away from Castabli. The second base goes Matt Cole. Meant the threat of pressure in the defense. I think uh, caused Castabli to be distracted there. And there's thus a wild pitch. So even without a bunt or a hit and run, they get the man in the scoring position with nobody out. Now looking to bunt. He had two balls to no strikes. You have Messenger waiting on deck. He's delivered four RBIs in this performance. Nine RBIs in his last two games here at State. Low and inside for ball three. A late break up that first baseline by Kyle Ziegler. Just joining us, the Pirate table to jump in front right from the get-go on the top of the first. Scoring three times. Count of three and one. And for the Pirates, knocking off Wausau East. Pulaski once again for another year, and then DC Everest to get here to state. Beauty of a bunt, covering the first base, Bagus Sinclair, and the third base moves Macomb. These guys execute well. So Neville gives himself up. And Messenger up there, and he'll, have, he'll see a drawn in infield, and that's always good news to a hitter. The four RBIs in this game now gives him 21 on the season. With Matt Holm 90 feet away. This Pirate team able to pull off that sectional final one against DC Everest, two to one, but kind of like today, at least the way this one has started, it's hard to come by. Just two runs on two hits in that W. Strong pitch and performance by Josh Nielsen at DC Everest. He had a 15 strikeout, two hit complete game outing, but a couple of miscues enabling the Pirates to score the eventual game winning run. They've been able to take advantage of this game of some free passes. A couple of timely hits. One by Messenger. One by Macomb. And a strikeout by Tybor. Messenger, the second out. Only his second or third punch shot of the day. His first since the second inning. And certainly came at a good time for Tybor, who can ill afford to give up any more runs. Team down to his last few out, uh, nine outs. Lucas Lindau on the backhand for Sinclair. Inning over with Macomb stranded over at third base. No runs on one hit, no errors, one left on. Middle of five, five nothing, Bayport. To the bottom of the fifth, a 5 nothing lead for the Bayport Pirates. The big chair out in right field. Jungle gym for fans of all ages. Did I see you over there earlier, bro? No, I try to stay away from you. You get hurt on that thing. <laughs> Heck of a view, though, for those yeah. youngsters out in right. Always popular. Seems like every time we come here, they've every year they've added something. Heck of an experience to check out baseball. Well, they're going to do a $5.8 million renovation here in the next yeah. year. Widen the concourses. Make it an even better experience for the fan. And even for us, as from a broadcast standpoint, talking about adding a second level that will include six new suites that above this current press box. I had a banquet hall open year-round that we'll see about... 250 people. You mentioned the expanded concession stands, the improved player facilities, and new facade along with a larger gift shop. All expected to be done in time for opening day in 2013 for the Timber Rattlers. Justin Castabli called out on strikes. Nine strikeouts now for Ben Messenger. And it's getting late for the Red Devils. They need something to happen. There's Jake Establi 
Comes up for only the third time in the game. He's the leadoff hitter for this team. He lowered the bat, but brought it back. Takes ball one. He's been a strikeout victim twice. The Red Devils have only been shut out once this year. That was by Wisconsin Lutheran. Matt told you they swing the bat 335 collectively. 180 runs and 20, uh, 24 games. So. And that Wisconsin Lutheran game, part of a three team tournament that Kenosha Bradford hosted. Thought was they wanted to prepare themselves if they were fortunate enough to get to the sectional round of play. But what they ended up doing was they played Milwaukee King in the first game, then allowed Milwaukee King to play Wisconsin Lutheran in game two before they played game three against Wisconsin Lutheran, just so they can get used to the sectional format. And for some younger players that may not be used to that format, got the opportunity maybe to rest. In case that's the way things put out in the sectionals, they play a game, sit and then play in that sectional final. Payoff. And Castabli, he earns the third walk from Messenger. So McCullough gets the hit with a man on base. And McCullough, who was hit by a pitch, he would double. And they're going to go out the mound and give Messenger some advice on how to pitch to this big left handed hitter. Yeah, so far he has been the only Red Devil who's not been retired at least once in this game. You mentioned they pitched around him. He was eventually hit by a pitch in that first plate appearance before that double off the fence in right field. Pirates in front, 5 nothing. Hartford and Middleton. Battle next to play the winner of this one coming up at approximately 6 o'clock tonight in a D1 state semifinal. Set up on the outside by Ney. Check swing foul for McCullis. That might have just been a pep talk saying, believe in yourself, and this guy has all the press clippings, but let's go right after him. And there he did. He jammed him. It's an audition for Messenger, too. Lots of, we see lots of college guys here. Rob Forn is here. Is he from Minnesota? Is here. And, Chris Schwartz from across, Pat Bone from Stevens Point. Superior sent their assistant coaching staff. One ball and one strike. Nice pitch. Off one speed. and two. Ties up McCullis. Before the season even began, McCullis had 25 visits to his house for Major League Baseball teams, including the Milwaukee Brewers. And from McTony throughout the day last week, he went in the third round by the Yankees. Can't even up at two and two. Otherwise, his backup plan was going to Louisville and playing for a summer team in Ohio this these next couple of months. Here's the two-two. How about that for a strikeout for Ben Messenger? Strikeout number ten. Piece of pitching by Messenger. He finally tied him up. Couldn't get at the fastball. It's only the sixth time this year McCullough has struck out. First time he has retired here this morning, bringing up Tony DiPartolo. On the first pitch over the head of Peterson. Breaks put on by Jake Costabli over at second. And that's human nature, I think, to let up after you punch out the the big star. He serves a cookie up there to DiBartolo, and he puts it in center field. Just the third hit for the Red Devils. Their first sends a double by McCullough's back in the third. 
Kleiber hasn't been retired today. Again, if the Red Devils are going to come back, they need a two-out hit in a big way right here. Third time in this ball game, they've had multiple runners on simultaneously. But so far, five been left on. Nothing in one at Kevin Tybor. Knees in corners. He walked his last plate appearance. Out at second base by way of a force out to put it into the third. But a 5 nothing lead for the Pirates. Able to set the tone in the first, added two more in the third. They too have been limited to three hits in the ball game. Set up on the outside from Taylor Ney. There goes the runner, and Leighton coming over to cover third was Macomb. Great jump off the second base back for Costabli, and with the ball skipping away, DiBartolo takes second. Costabli got hurt, and is going to seek medical attention. You've got to make this if you're Costabli. you got to make sure you're going to make this down five runs with two out. He gets in there, and I don't know how he got hurt, quite frankly, because he hurt his wrist. And he is in pain. Anyway, when the ball caromed away from Macomb, that enabled DiBartolo to trot on down to second. They think it's got to be an error to allow DiBartolo to take the extra base. And as you can see, Gustavo, the catcher, in some pain. So the athletic trainer working on the wrist area and staying out there is Jake Costabli. Emphasis on that left wrist. Second and third with two down. Count nothing at two on the Red Devil pitcher. And Messenger gets strikeout number 11. Three strikeouts here in the fifth. And another pair left in scoring position. Seven have been left on base in the game for Bradford. After five, five nothing, Bayport. As we move to the top of the sixth inning, the call to the bullpen has been made by the Red Devils. And in from right field is Colton Lee. Well, Matt told you he's the other half of their Starting pitching tandem, he comes in in relief here, six and one, with a 164 ERA. He's a big kid at 6'4", 220. Ninth game is second out of the bullpen. He's thrown five complete games, completing five of the seven he started. He's got a save in 47 innings. Leaves about 36 hits, 11 earned runs. He's walked 22 and fanned 54. And again, he's coming off that sectional final complete game win against Burlington, in which he would allow four runs on four hits. Striking out three and walking six. Lucas Lindau taking strike one. Anthony Eisen has taken Lee's spot out in right field. And for Kevin Tybor, his book is closed after five innings, allowing five runs, three hits, three strikeouts. But big stat, six walks. He didn't command the ball very well early, and he didn't get helped by an error by his shortstop in that first inning as well. At first, producing three runs with only one hit, seven coming to the plate. And all three runs were unearned. And a strikeout. Uh, Lucas Lindau. This young man throws pretty well coming in out of right field. Got half an inning to warm up and... To the mound he goes. But Lee also a junior, and one of the reasons why Kenosha Bradford felt like coming in, they, from well, a pitching standpoint, awfully young. It would only go as quickly as their pitching developed here this season. Getting Michael Swift, the 2011 Southeast Conference Player of the Year, moving on. And Playing for Tom Lechner at UW Oshkosh. It's 
squad they lost quite a bit of talent from that of a year ago they lost their outfielder Dustin Eschbach he went to Carthage Chris Millard football with UWI water in the infield John Stevens in the infield with UW Oshkosh and then Ryan Furtney their first baseman But again, when you add the 124th pick in the draft, that's yeah. not a bad addition no. to replace those guys in the left. That's a good recruiting year. No, no doubt for uh, Coach Labrudas. There's a base hit for Aaron Hermsen. I'll check that with Hunter Callen. Now back to the top of the order and Joey Callowitz. And I would think they might put something on here to try to add another run. Callen hasn't stolen a base. But Callowitz seems to handle the bat pretty well. Ball getting away from Kostabli. That's Callen now in scoring position. Mentioning Matt Laputa a second ago. He's back for his eighth season. Losing 12 of those seniors, but as you mentioned, gaining McCullis here back after a one-year hiatus. Count nothing at two now on Callowitz. Well, Tapper up that first baseline. Lee will take it himself. To third goes Callen. Job by Cowards to move the runner up. Lee decides I'll take it. So that's a big insurance run at third. And here's Grabick, who got three walks against the starter Tiber. Grabick behind nothing in one. Got among those six honored by the Fox River Classic Conference this year. At Graybick, Lindenau, Peterson, and Macomb on top of Messenger, all first team all conference selections. Again, Messenger, the co conference player of the year. Brett Neville, who's been batting fifth for this ball game, playing first base. Second team all conference selection for a second straight season. Counter the ball and two strikes. Five, six, seven to do it for the Red Devils in the bottom half of this sixth inning. Team that's left seven on base now. Just been a little high. Three and two. Had to go get Gravick to go up the ladder there. Gravick doing a nice job here. Showed good plate discipline all day. Looking for his fourth walk. What a day for Gravick. Four plate appearances, four walks. He's come around to score twice. He has stolen a base. And now Colton Peterson. Peterson. And again, be alive for a double steal or something here. Particularly because they're aware that the catcher, Kostabli, has that bad wrist as we the injured last half inning. And this inning that began with Hermson striking out, first batter to face Colton Lee. Callen picking up a single before the one unassisted. There goes the runner. Now they throw it on the third baseline and sliding back in safely as Callen after Graybeck is able to take off and take second. They almost picked Callen off as they faked the throw through and then threw behind the Callen who had a dive back to beat the throw. One and two. Low. That's down. Nope. 
Peterson, he has scored once in this ball game. He reached by way of the lone error in the game. That ball takes a funny hop on Simon Sid. In the score from third is Hunter Callen. And the Pirates now have a 6 0 lead. Well, that ball just eats Simonson up, and caroms to DeBarto is short, and he decided to eat the ball and not make a throw. Let's see this again. It's a bad hop in the third baseman. Comes up and caroms off him, goes all the way out to short. DeBarto elects not to throw to first. It's a run. They call it a bad hop single. That means it's an RBI for Peterson. Bayport leads six zip. And the offer for Brock Macomb off the appeal. Yeah, Josh Saylor, he is the first place umpire here in this first game. Macomb has yet to be retired. He has walked, he has tripled, he has single, and he has scored twice. Hi, Hopper over the head of Lee, but a nice backup for Luke Sinclair. Able to rock it to throw over to Ziegler to retire the Pirate third baseman. Another run comes in to score. It's the middle of six, and the Pirates now lead 6 0. 6 outs to work with for Kenosha Bradford, down 6 0 as we move to the bottom of the sixth inning in this Division I state quarterfinal. Matt Menzel with Bill Brophy here from Time Warner Cable Field at Fox City Stadium in Grand Chute for the start of the 65th annual WIAA Spring Baseball State Tournament. Right fielder turned pitcher Colton Lee leading off against Ben Messenger. Coming off a three strikeout fifth. 11 strikeouts in the ball game. And he has been the story of this game with those strikeouts and then four RBIs with the bats. But he hasn't given Bradford much of a sniff today. Macomb on the low throw. The basket catch made by Neville. Lee on the 5 3 put out. And again, this was the plan all year. Mike Simons admitted he pitched Messenger too much in short rest last year, so he is a little careful with the left hander's arm this year, never pitching him in less than four days' rest. That means he didn't pitch in the conference title game against De Pere, but he figured he wanted him ready for grand shoot, and now he is here on the big stage. The question is, was the batter hit there? I think he, Simonson begging that he was, and I don't think the umpire agrees. Again, that the peer team ultimately derailing Bayport in their hopes of a three-peat in the Fox River Classic Conference. But Simons elected not to pitch Messenger in that game, despite the fact that it was the, the conference title was on the line because he didn't want to pitch him on short rest and risk the messing up Messenger's arm. He felt that he was better in full rest all year, and the goal was to get Messenger here in the big stage, and he has certainly performed. Kind of one ball and two strikes with Simonson. Collado waits on deck. We have one down here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Strikeout number 12. Second time looking for Simonson. That is four. Four of the strikeouts have come. I'm called third ones. In fact, he has fanned everyone in the order. I was looking it up just because I was curious to know what the strikeout record was for. Oh, that big left hander that went on to Whitewater had a bundle of them here from a small school. There was a 20 strikeout performance in Division One back in 1958. Must have must have been an extra inning game. Or, of course, all but one of those outs by way of the K. But that's the record. There've been a bunch that have been around. 16 and 18 strikeouts. 12 regardless, very impressive, especially against this kind of a lineup that he is facing. Aaron Dott was the kid I was thinking of. He had 15 in a Division IV game here, 2006. End up moving on to the Northwoods League and pitched a no-hitter with the lacrosse loggers.
Two balls and two strikes to Collada. We'll do it again. It's amazing though, when you look at that record book, some of the strikeout totals that have occurred here in the state tournament, especially in Division One over the last number of years. Here's the 2-2. Two -two. Just dig it a piece of it. You have Simonson who has struck out on three occasions. For Messenger, three Ks in the first, two on the second, two on the third. He only struck out one, but a one, two, three, fourth, and three Ks in the fifth. And now two Ks here in the sixth. Strikeout 13 for number seven, Ben Messenger. Kalana down by way of strike three for a second time. Six complete, six nothing Pirates. As we move to the top of the seventh inning, a couple of defensive changes for Kenosha Bradford. We'll see Matt Blackett. Now behind the plate, he is catching Colton Lee. And now Andrew Castle is at third base for Danny Simonson. Castle, one of the team's six seniors, down to their final three outs in this, their prep careers. And in the bullpen, Brandon Jeffrey, another one of those seniors. He may pitch the seventh inning. He's getting heated up. Or he may pitch part of the seventh inning, I'm assuming. One ball and one strike to Brett Neville. Had a sacrifice bunt, a successful sacrifice bunt back on the fifth. Macomb moved the third on that first out, but was stranded 90 feet away. Count one and two, already a strikeout for Lee. Back to work for his second inning after Kevin Tybor went five. And a punch out of Brett Neville. He strikes out for the second time in the ball game. That's the fifth K for Red Devil pitching. A pitcher. And I think we're going to get the senior pitcher in the game right here. Before Messenger hits. And this is just, I think, Obuda's way of rewarding some seniors that have worked hard. They certainly haven't waved the white flag, but down six with... In the top of the seventh, things don't look good for the Red Devils. And in the big picture, an opportunity to get a couple kids in who's been good to your program. So Colton Lee lasting one and one third. And allowing one run off of a couple of hits. Striking out a pair and walking one. Seven walks in all between Tybor and Lee. To check out. Brandon Jeffrey, who is getting loose, the 6'2", 180-pound senior right-hander. He is 3-1 with a 4.06 Ernie this year. This is his ninth game, his fifth out of the bullpen. In 20 and two-thirds, Brandon's allowed 17 hits, 12 earned runs. He's walked 26 and struck out 26. So command has been an issue for this right-hander. He's allowed more to walk in inning. The winner of this game gets the winner of the next one, Middleton and Hartford Union, scheduled to go about 10.30, and that may be about right. 35 minutes at the conclusion of this one officially. Then around one, Stevens Point plays Oconomowoc, and Appleton North takes on top-rated Sun Prairie roughly around 3.30. The winner of this game and the winner of the next game played six in the semi tonight in the last semifinal, probably about 8.45 tonight. Championship game Thursday in Division One at 6 p.m. I see you got your day all planned out. I do. Structure is important in your life. <laughs> what do you have, 16 games these next three days? Yeah, a lot of fun. So what Jeffrey are... against Messenger has been the hero of the day with uh, the four RBIs at the plate, and he's just been dominant on the hill. On the very first pitch he sees, it is hit number six for the Pirates. 
That's what he did in the first inning against Tiber. With the bases loaded, he hit a first pitch fastball down in the right field corner, emptying the bases, and the Red Devils never recovered. It'd be a courtesy rudder for Messenger, who has been the hero for the Pirates. Uh, Jake Heinzen will be that courtesy runner. Lucas Lindau behind nothing in one. He has grounded out the second base on two occasions. He has also walked and came back in the third. He was left. So far, seven have been left on for the Pirates. Six across on six hits. They have thus far played error free. Red Devils no runs on three hits with one error, and they have left a total of seven on including a couple at third base. A base hit in front of Anthony Eisen. Wide turn around second, but back to second goes Heinzen. Back-to-back -back singles, first and second, one down off of Brandon Jeffery. Piece of hitting there by Linda to go the other way. And now Aaron Hermsen. First pitch with the infield fly. DiBartolo puts it away over at short. Two down for Hunter Callen. He's one for three in the ball game with single, advanced on a wild pitch, came around to score the team's sixth run last inning. He's the fifth batter here in the seventh. There have been some lengthy innings put together by the Pirates. Had a couple of seven batter innings. A six batter sixth. And they have certainly made Tybor and Lee work, as mentioned, with the seven combined walks between those two. Oh, here they've been aggressive going out to the first couple pitches they had seen from Jeffrey. Two balls and a strike to the Pirate left fielder. If you are wondering, Kenosha Bradford sends up the eight, nine, and one hitters in the seventh inning. One of those fellows would have to get on for McCullough's to get another swing as a high school player. And so far, those three have gone a combined 0 for 6. By the diving, Andrew Castle. Rounding third is Heinzen. Now he's going to... Retreat back after the throw from Castabli over to Matt Black at the new catcher. And the base is loaded for Bayport. Second hit of the day for Callen. Castabli short-handed the back up to his brother. <laughs> Made a strong throw, but it carried off the catcher's shoulder. And so here's Calwarts with the bases loaded. Little spark plug leadoff man hasn't had a hit today. Gallowards came in with that 274 average. Working here with two outs. Taking strike one. Again, as mentioned, Matt Blackett now catching with Castle over a third. If Eisen in right field and on the mound with Brandon Jeffrey. Some of the defensive changes of the last couple of innings for the Red Devils. Sixth batter here in the seventh. Count now at two balls and a strike. Black was able to block it. Look at Jake Hines in your lead runner, 90 feet away. Courtesy runner for Ben Messenger. Three and one. This is the second time Bayport's had the bases loaded. In the first with two on, Messenger unloaded the bases with a double, the key hit in the game. So 
So Heinsohn will come in and score. Pirates now lead seven to nothing. Eighth walk issue now by the Red Devils pitching. Lindau to third, Callen at second base. And Ryan Graybeck who has walked four times. And I'm a little surprised, but it goes to show you again when we talked about how Simon's concerned about Messenger's arm for the long haul. But with his comfortable lead, he has no one up throwing. You would think you might want to bring Messenger back in two days in the title game if you got that far for an inning. You can only throw seven innings in a three-day span under WIA rules. But there is no activity, so Messenger apparently is going to be given the opportunity to finish what he starts. And again, that may be symptomatic of the deal Simons has had with Messenger all year to protect that arm. They kind of had that issue in the sectional round of games and decision-making as far as Obviously, a messenger goal in that sectional semifinal being your ace to get him to the final. There's a base hit. Graybick able to drive in a pair. 9 0 Pirates. So Graybick finally gets to swing the bat and he drives in two runs. He's been on five times today, and the route is on for the Pirates. And now Colton Peterson. Yeah, that sectional final from a coaching standpoint, they had the decision to make as to whether or not to go with their right-hander, Ryan Frieder, or a lefty. It decided to go that route with Jack Violetta. Pitched a complete game. Those three, though, have been... Well, actually, Simons is thinking along with me. He's now getting somebody up. So he, I think he wants that messenger available for another inning left in this tournament now that the score has gotten out of hand. Again, this is a pitching staff that throughout the season has put together remarkable numbers. That collective 1.31 ERA. They've had three no-hit performances on the season. One of those was a no-hit loss. They had a funny hop, but Sinclair able to adjust that to retire Peterson, but not before three more runs come in to score. And the Pirates, three outs away from advancing to a semifinal on top of Brantford, 9-0. To the bottom of the seventh, a 9-0 lead for the Bayport Pirates over the Brantford Red Devils. 8-9, one of who have gone a combined 0 for 6. Facing Ben Messenger, who has struck out 13. Kyle Ziegler first up. He's a strikeout victim and also flew out to right feet. Coach Simon just didn't get the bullpen up in time to get warm. When that rally fizzled, he had a didn't have a reliever ready, so Messenger will finish what he starts. Meaning he will elapse all his innings of work as a pitcher in this tournament right here. Messenger has struck at everybody in the lineup at least once for the Red Devils. And he strikes out Ziegler for a second time. Again, that's the fifth called third strike of the 14. So 14 out of the first, 19 outs in the ball game by way of the strikeout, and now it's Justin Costabli. He would strike out his last AB. He's 0 for 2, grounded out the second base as well back in the second. for the Pirates in this, their ninth state tournament appearance. They will be moving on to the, the semis and two outs. 
That for a fifth consecutive appearance. Again, bringing home the title on both 09 and again in 2010 with wins against Wilmot, but also against Madison LaFile, in which Ken Messenger had a big five RBI performance. Four RBIs and the 14 strikeouts for the Southpaw here this morning. Well, if you want to see McCullough take another swing, that was good news. As he's on deck. For Kenosha Bradford. And now Matt Blackett, who came in the catch last half inning. At the plate, batting 133. He's two for 15. I don't like Matt in this matchup. <laughs> he has fanned eight times. And already behind nothing in two. Well, messages have gone after guys all day. He's walked just three, hit a batter. But he's pitched from in front and mixed a 12-6 curveball with a fastball that's generally in the high 80s. And strikeout number 15. And now Nathan McCullis. He struck McCullis out the last time after McCullis one hopped the ball off the right field wall in the third. The only extra base hit allowed today by Messenger. And this kid's the third round draft choice in the New York Yankees. And again, officially one for two in the ball game was also hit by a pitch in the first. One and one. Red Devils looking to avoid being shut out for a second time this year. As Rolf mentioned earlier, also shut out by Wisconsin Lutheran. Out away from their season, coming to a close. Count two balls and a strike. Another strikeout would put Messenger tied for third and most uh, it's in the top 10 of most strikeouts in a Division I title game. A couple of big leaguers on that list. Dick Bosman went on to pitch for the Washington Senators, did it for Kenosha in 1962. Howie Coplitz, who went on to pitch for the Tigers, did it for Oshkosh in 1956. And McCullough draws a two-out walk. First and second. DiBartolo. Well, it's now going to be Andrew Castle who came in to, to play third base. He has taken over that number three spot. Castle coming in with a 222 average. Not sure what that visit was about. I mean, to make sure that Messenger fell okay. He has walked five of the ball game, two in the seventh. And now the first AB for Castle. Nothing in two. And a game that has seen Messenger and the Pirates lead from the get-go. Only adding to that three-run advantage after the first. As the fans from Bayport rise to their feet. A special performance from Ben Messenger. And his 16th strikeout 
The Pirates move it on to a Division I state semifinal. Now, this was truly the, the Brad Messenger show, or Ben Messenger's show, excuse me. Four RBIs, the game turning hit. They had a bases clearing double in the first inning. Gabe Messenger, the pitcher, a three-run lead before he even towed the rubber, and then he strikes out 16. Again, that ties him with the uh, with a bunch of others, but he's in the top 10 for most strikeouts ever in a state tournament game. Hal Galeen of Eau Claire has the mark of 20 in 1958, but Messenger joins a handful of guys with 16, and he was just impressive mixing a 12-6 a to six curveball, which had... Red Devils off stride all day with a, a fastball that he showed him and went up the ladder constantly with. He was the story, and a very impressive story at that. Bayport goes on behind Ben Messenger. They'll play this afternoon or tonight at 6 o'clock against either Middleton or uh, Hartford Union, who will be ready about on schedule at 10.30. See the final line score, the nine runs, nine hits, no errors, nine left on for the Pirates. Three in the first, two in the third, one in the sixth, three in the seventh. Red Devils shut off for the second time this season. This one into their season, second straight year and a quarter final loss. No runs on three hits, one error, nine left on base. Messenger, of course, the three hit shut out the 16 strikeout performance, gets the win. And Kevin Tybor, he lasted five, suffered defeat. For the Red Devils, your season comes to a close at 23 and 5. Pirates moving on at 24 and 6 with their eighth consecutive win. Stay tuned. Continuing coverage of the 65th annual WIA Spring Baseball State Tournament will continue in about a half hour. As Rolf mentioned, it is game two. Middleton and Hartford. Winner gets Bayport. Six o'clock, approximate start time to the two winners semifinal. For Bill Brophy, our entire crew, Matt Mendel saying so long for now from Time Warner Cable Stadium at Fox City Stadium here in Grand Chute. You've been watching continuing coverage of the 65th annual WIAA Spring Baseball State Tournament on Fox Sports, Wisconsin.